Okay, we're live. I'm going to give this a few seconds because people were saying that the that there was a little bit of a delay in jumping from the presentation to this talk. So we'll give it 20 seconds. Yeah, it warrants um, between five and 30. Yeah. Um, yeah, wow, this is quite a piece of research, huh? Uh, kind of cross dis so much cross-disciplinary uh, stuff going on here. It's a lot less spooky than it looks. I've done very simple things cross okay. cross discipline to try and uh, to try and make it as less as little spook as possible. Um, yeah, but it is uh, a lot when you just look at it. So it seems like people are in the chat now. So I'll uh, relay the questions. So I think the first question asked, as far as I can see, was from Stephanie Forrest, and she's asking, "How does your work compare to Lee Spector's work?" using GP to design quantum programs, if you're aware of that work. Yes. So if you, you if you do anything on GP on quantum, Lee Spector is the first book you read. Um, mm -hmm. This is what we've taken as sort of the baseline. Um, mm -hmm. Lee Spector does a lot more idea work than practical things, but he does he does everything. He's amazing. Uh, I do not want to personally compare myself to Lee Spector because he's, he, he, he's sort of like the man in the field. Um, so we did look at what he was doing and try and figure a few holes that there were. Uh, and try and try and sort things around. Um, the main one I was looking at is when we are doing our GI, we've got our our mutation functions. Um, for quantum, it's actually quite hard to find those mutation functions. Um, so our method used what would be considered quite a strange representation, and part of the reason we chose that representation, the the, the ZX grass, is it allows some mutation functions that would be hard to implement otherwise. Um, so. Uh, it's sort of hard to compare everything we've done, but the first thing we did was we read Lee Spector and think, all right, what else can we do on top of this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's uh, good. Uh, I'll, re I'll go on to the next question, uh, which I believe is from Wes Weimer. Uh, so Wes Weimer uh, thinks that there's been work in non-quantum non-quantum circuit optimization, uh, and he points out an example as a Humi Award winner in 2015, evolutionary approach to approximate digital circuits. Uh, he's curious what the key differences between this and the quantum side are. Um, so the the actual innate thing of having a quantum bit actually does make some physical differences in how the organization goes. Mm -hmm. um, it's much easier to represent and sort of discretize each separate function in a classical circuit optimization. Mm -hmm. So when you're, you're building that circuit, um, each thing can sort of run a separate trend. In, in quantum, they are all slightly entangled. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you do need to optimize for a circuit and for a program that runs simultaneously. Uh, and that can make it quite difficult in placing these things. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's a few ones, so I'm just going to be quite quick. Uh, mm -hmm. We know how classical circuits work a lot better than quantum circuits. We know how to make classical algorithms, and we know how to make classical programs. Uh, it's much harder to do that for quantum ones. So when we're trying to put, um, here's how we automate how I would make a circuit. If you're doing that for quantum, it's not here it's how I would automate how I would make a quantum circuit. It's here's trying to automate something that I don't think I'd know how to do. Uh, quite a lot of the time. Um, and then the final one is just that uh, quantum computers are, are a very new field. Um, so there's quite a lot of rough aroundness around the edge that, that doesn't exist so much in classical systems. Um, there's a lot of things that just don't work very well. And there's a lot of things that we just can't do. And we could work out how to do them later, but it's not cost appropriate to say, let's try and solve that now. We just sort of need to work with the problems. Uh, and that's what I'd say the three main ones are. It's that near, near term quantum computers are much rougher. Um, the design space is more complicated and inherently parallel. So the structure is much harder to, to exploit. Um, and then the, uh, the fact that we actually don't really know how, how, how best to use quantum when we do really know how to best uh, optimize a circuit for the most part. So uh, Wes kind of has a somewhat follow-up question for this. Uh, Retargeting is a great application, but if we were to apply GI to synthesize quantum programs from high-level specs, something that people have wanted to do for a while, what would you have to change? 
what are the key uh, challenges in this domain and insights? Um, so I've been, I'm looking into this. That, that, that's sort of like one of my main areas work. Uh, the big one is scaling. If we want to make a, a reasonably safe program, this gets very complicated very quickly. Mm. Um, what I've been pushing for a lot is uh, we need the same software engineering structures that we have on classical systems so that when we're synthesizing, we're not doing this huge, awful step. We have broken down steps that scale better. Um, and that's sort of my big thing when it comes to how do we synthesize quantum programs? Currently, the steps are quite lumped. Um, and we I think we want to try and break these up as much as possible, automate as much as possible. So we try and work out um, what we can do on smaller level steps. Uh, and that's why I've done retargeting. It's because in the total stack of synthesizing, at some point, we want to retarget. So let's see how GI works on one step, then see if we can scale up to a different step. Um, so yeah, those are my two insights. We need software engineering structure. We need to break down the problem. Uh, one, and this is my favorite, I have no idea. <laughs> it's a very new field. Um, so th there's going to be more challenges than I know of. By, I, but I, I think for now, it, it just makes the most sense for me that we focus on single steps. And then if those work, we look at what worked and what didn't. Um, and I, I, I know there'll be theorists and you're, you're, you're and they'll be saying, so why are we trying this? And I'm a big fan of the idea that sometimes we just need to try things and see what happens. And that, that's a large part of, of which steps should be GI'd and which steps shouldn't. Mm. Good answer. Uh, uh, Bill has a question about error. Uh, you say that you optimize for error. Is this error on, is this error on a particular machine? Is it real or simulated? Basically, how do you measure this error? So what we've been doing is the accumulated uh, chance of a single gate causing um, so what essentially would be a, a quantum bit flip. Um, so uh, we've got these on real machines. Um, these are, it, it's three IBM quantum machines. Um, they've been benchmarked quite, quite well. Uh, I won't go into exactly how they did that. But yeah, these are uh, real machines. Um, I've just taken the, the, the benchmark errors uh, and then the, sorry, so error on a particular machine. Yes, it's those those actual physical ones, but we can sub in. Is this real or simulated? This is real. How do you measure error? Um, essentially, we run a bunch of uh, types of circuit, and we sort of estimate how much did this cause here uh, and, and work out as a benchmark. Um, we are assuming a bit more staticness of error than exists, but it becomes very impractical. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I had a very similar question to Bill. I'm very out of touch with this quantum computer domain. Uh, doing this sort of research with the current hardware available, is it like, I really don't know where you start with it. Is it kind of an easy thing to measure? Like, is it something you can just write a program to do? Uh, sorry, what do you mean? Like, I'm not sure even I know what I mean at this stage. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, <laughs> I'll have I mean, a how, how do you interact with these machines to run your experiments, for example? Um, so it, it, it ends up looking a lot more like an assembly language. You mm -hmm. have um, these sort of physical actions that a machine can take, mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you put those in order. Mm -hmm. um, there are various tools that will take higher level definitions, like, for example, ZX graphs, and turn mm -hmm. those into those physical actions. Um, but it's easier to think of this like a GPU optimization than mm. um, like a Python script. Oh, you, okay. uh, and I think that helps a lot. If it's a black box quantum processing unit, mm. um, it is a little hard to work on the specifics. But uh, okay. we have uh, less than one minute left, left. We have one more question. So try to, do, try to make this fast. Uh, from Wes, uh, I. Uh, uh, I am only familiar with Grover's quantum search algorithm. What sort of human understandable changes, retargeting decisions, what would does your approach make when applied to a simple algorithm like Grover's? Very quick example. If one mm -hmm. qubit on average has lower er error running a gate than another qubit, we'll move the operations from that worse qubit to the better qubit. Um, wow. <laughs> uh, I've never seen someone answer a question about quantum computing in and 10 seconds before. <laughs> <laughs> it's an art. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so that's the uh, end of this session. Thank you very much for your talk. We'll be moving to the next talk, which is uh, improving novelty in procedural storytelling, story, story generation.